Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of various stories from across the internet. In this series we will be focusing on a web novel called There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video we will be doing chapters 31 to 33. If you would like access to the absolute latest recordings of any of the chapters in this series or any of the other ones that I am currently doing, please head over and have a look at my Patreon account. Any help would be very much appreciated. But, as always, I hope that you enjoy. There is no Epic Lucha, only puns, Chapter 31, Japping About. Delta watched Aswa narrowed his beady little eyes into the rough shape in the middle of the fort room. Mr. Mushy watched from a slightly down the hall, unwilling to get any closer to the heat. The fire died down and the scorched thing wobbled slightly. Delta had only come to check on things to see if her gobs had returned. Instead, she had found most of the four monsters gathered around Swa and his fire magic cooking something. What is that? Delta asked faintly at the misshapen black thing smoke near the foot of the hill, away from the wooden structures. Omushi came nearer. It seemed to be unable to look away from the black thing. It sagged to one side, and the odd ears and loopy things on the sides made it look like a haunched man that Swa had just cooked. Swa sniffed as he admired his work. Done. Bring next one he commanded, and Mr. Mushy waddled out, both of his hands holding down the muddy thing. He put it down and began to pat the sides as they become runny. It was around when Mr. Mushy's hands came away covered in mud. Swa cracked the flesh and fried it as Mr. Mushy ran away from the licks of fire, possibly, and back into the tunnel with protection. Num cheered and its billy shot Swa a glare. The bow using goblin murmured something to Mr. Mushy, and the giant being clapped his hands. The pot looked like a misshapen as the first one that Delta watched as Num dragged it off into the corner where five or six more black pots sat. What's going on? Delta asked casually, and Swa yelped, hiding his staff behind his back. Num panicked and just threw the pot onto the hill where it hit the slope and rolled, bumped and tumbled its way back down with a hollow clunking sound. Billy just snorted and pushed his green cap down his watch the scene. New appeared with a rather sour sounding ding. They are attempting to create art. It seems like they, or rather Mr. Mushy, was inspired to try his hand at the craft after seeing your pot. It has been met with laughter and fire. The mushroom molds it from the mud and the goblin cooks it to ash. It's quite frustrating as they don't actually seem to be learning how to correct themselves. The menu appeared to be frustrated, and Dalda hid a smile as she answered. Not everyone learns to understand something or replicate it after one attempt or sample. Some of us have to practice. Dalda hummed and knew seemed to let out a low noise. Then why bother? This project will never offer any fruit. They are wasting your mud and making swaths waste energy. Those pots will be reabsorbed into the dungeon system, and they don't improve or offer any new designs. I just don't understand why they are so invested in doing this. Delta watched as Mr. Mushy hurriedly patting a new pot. He seemed to be trying to give this pot a moustache and a monocle, for some odd reason. Swa was still frozen on the spot, smoke still coating from his staff. Num tried to hide the pots behind himself and failed utterly. Billy was rather calm, but he was also looking a little guilty at taking part. Hmm, there is no reason. They're doing something fun. Fun is just fun. You should try it. Make a pot or something. Dalton encouraged and then bent down to smile at Swa. Less heat and they'll actually look good then, hmm? She giggled and got up and head to the grove. Swa nodded and her words were command. Less, less fire. He repeated in a petulant tone. Delta complimented Mr. Mushy as she went past, and the giant fungus tried to bow, but seemed to forget that he was in a war and blinked in confusion as his cap hit something slithered and the force from that. In turn, tapped him over and he landed into the sitting position. Delta smiled as Billy moved over to help without a word. The little archer seemed to like Mr. Mushy, and that made Delta pleased as a button. The sound of roaring fire rushed out, and Num's voice called out, Master, say less, less! 
he said in a panic, Swa just cackling loudly again. I cannot make a pot, Talta slowed as she entered the grove. Storks on some natural shrooms were easily taller than some men. Oh, it's fine, just try. Delta encouraged again and you made a frustrated sound. I cannot make a pot. I cannot spend mana. I cannot control your power. I am men you. I am not dungeon. I am not Delta. I am efficient tool designed to help you grow as a dungeon. Delta frowned and then shook her head. Sounds nice and easy out loud, but you aren't a menu, not anymore. New, besides being rude, cocky, and a bit of a know-it-all, you're my friend. Not at all. She reminded the box of the shimmered into the red, as Delta took a step back and rang furiously. I did not ask for it. I did not ask to be this. I thought it was a whim or some cruel idea, or some bad choice that you made, but I see it all around you. Things do not act like they should. Things are not logical, or even right in this dungeon. Monsters are not friends. Cause do not feel remorse. They don't create havens for humans. I know this, and yet, it's all around me. I cannot make a pot, because if I tried to do that, then I could, and I'm not right. I am not a menu. I am broken. The box faded to a red somber purple. Delta just waited her mind going blank, as this was not something she expected. So, did the only thing that she could do. Make a pot, she repeated, and knew seemed to grow in size, if trying to appear angrier. But with another angry ring, a word appeared. Fine. Delta watched as a spot in front of them shimmered, and that something began to form. Her manner dipped and the object appeared. No, Delta trailed off, and the tech spot had gone very still. Delta's lips twitched as the box went very bright pink. Not a word. Delta inhaled softly, and the noise escaped her mouth. It was a chortle, then a giggle, and then Delta just gave out and burst out laughing. She could only watch as Bori sniffed the pot that was even uglier than Delta's. It was more like a pot that had been ugly and then fattened by a car, resurrected by some novice voodoo priest, and then dropped out of a plane. Delta slapped her knee as she laughed and began to cause physical pain, but she couldn't stop. Nu was texting in a small font, his version of muttering. I followed Manda. I've never used... I didn't... Not, I Stop laughing at me. Nu demanded, but Delta could only walk away and lean against the wall. The only thing broken, Delta paused to catch her breath as the giggle again. It's your artistic talent. Delta grinned and Nu shimmered red. Hardly amazing yourself, Miss Noodle's handles. Your pots look like some crime against mankind. Abruptly, Delta's laughter ceased, and she put her hands on her hips, her voice dropping low. Is that a challenge? She demanded and knew seemed to turn away as if dismissing her words. We don't have the manner to waste on such things. Delta shrugged, walking to meet the returning gobs. That's fine. We both know that means my pot is the better one. She said pleasantly, and Nu gave a mocking ding noise. If by better, you mean more likely to make people cry. Then yes, your pot is very much better. Delta hid another smile as if Nu followed her, bombarding her with criticisms and defenses of his own pot. Maybe he was broken, Delta didn't know, but he was a friend, and anyone that made such a big fuss over pots couldn't be wrong existence. Just funny, and Delta hoped that New would be understand one day. It was bad enough that one of them had a broke down every other day. No need to double up on this particular activity. Quiss, you can stop glaring at the forest. Dabagos got the hint. She's gone home already. Grudy grumbled as Quiss paced around the front of the dungeon entrance. The level quake was stirred up some of the old hunters. Quiss knew any one of them could sneak past him if he moved too far from the entrance. It had taken some loss of temper that Quiss almost regretted to send people back home. Sure, most of them could break Quiss in some manner or at least give him a run for his wizard hat, but no one wanted to start anything. Quist wiped some sweat from his brow as he remembered how a fight nearly broke out between himself and a rather stubborn capromancer. Then old lady Josie arrived and everyone sulked and went back home. I don't think it's just her. Could be others. They all got the rush. 
and we feel that as well the manor around here skyrocketed. I won't be surprised if one begins to walk about near dusk, or half the teens become lush-struck idiots and try to conquer this dungeon as some made-up trial or worse. Someone tries to influence Delta. Quiz snapped at Rudy, sipped down something that he was sure was semi-illegal in some places. He would control the dungeon in both the fool and the genius. If one could give endless supplies to a dungeon, but only one kind, then the dungeon would grow in that direction. The easiest path to follow, and the dungeon would follow it. Gus hesitated after that thought, and Delta was no more core infant. She had a rational mind, and that only made it worse. Delta was so nice, and that Gus knew that one hint of the villager just needed something, and Delta would leap to give it to them in the flesh. Hence why he and Rudy were outside. They weren't going to influence Delta at such a critical stage until she filled the second floor of her own design. Durance had its share of characters, and not all of them could pass the karma spell test. Not that anyone really could fail them anymore. Way too many ways to lie to magic and gods around these days. The races of the world really could do a lot of damage, but a few clinks of a coin. Monologuing is a sign of being broody, about to hit a chosen puberty or someone ignoring their friend. Rudy said lightly and Chris turned with a narrowed expression. I'm a broody bastard, what of it? He said impatiently and Rudy rolled her eyes. She stood up from the ground and Chris couldn't ignore how much her eyes glowed or how, additionally, defiant she was. Her arms looked thicker and Chris tried not to make it obvious that he's noticing the extra height Rudy now. Not too much but enough that he would have to adjust to meet her eyes. Manna. To many people, it was many different things. It was also one thing that was trouble. Most people got a high or a rush, feeling better than most of their life when they enter a manna rich area or a manna came to them. To orcs, they grew more bestial. More passionate at best, stubborn at worst. The drakes lost their snake-like features and began to walk around like rulers. Like their ancient parents, owls red, wood dark, and the old ones became more ethereal. Chris knew a wood elf that was in the middle of building a Jolton battle suit when the war shop got flooded with rare mana cloud. The elf had walked out of the workshop three days later and his suit was a cloak. The things that piece of fabric did made Chris feel like a child with matches in his pocket. Halflings, the deeps, the plain tribe, the monsters, the... Chris rubbed his nose. The list went on to nearly all living things, and some even non-living, depending on what it was. Manna made them more or less, and they became capable of great things, but to those who were not ready, it was a drug. Rudy. She grew, Chris knew that being a halfling was never exactly easy. One could get lucky and get some ugly mismatched peaches, or really unlucky and get more. Chris knew Rudy would punch him if even thinking the word, half-blooded, the child of two different races. People, all people, shortened it to halfling. It annoyed the shorter races and the half-blooded. In some places, people used it as a reference to the fact that most half-bloodeds were runts at best. Mismatched biology never worked. Exactly for the best. For Ruli, it had worked like art. Ruli was, as far as Chris had known her, never been someone you could point to and say, runt. Not if one wanted teeth afterwards. Chris, don't give me that look. Your eyes are just fire. She said quietly, and Kuss closed them as an unconscious reaction. He did not like people staring into his eyes when they went like that. Majors were not exempt from mana empowerment. Really, it could manifest in many ways. A woman he knew, Clara Cheese Fortress, had visions of Lost Tuesday. Nothing interesting, just she couldn't escape Tuesday. Another mage, Armor One Sword Beast, could paint an art and even Kuss felt moved by, but the man never remembered doing it. Himself, he burned. He burned if he did not control himself. Anquis would never, never let go of that control until that day came. Rudy patted him on the head like an affectionate pet. Puss growled, but Rudy smirked. Come on, let's grab a drink. I'm growing, you're smoking. It's the right kind of mood. 
She scratched her chin and Chris gave her a long look before he spoke. Worst come on ever, he muttered and really snorted. Please, we tried and you ignored me for a week before I broke into your house. She smiled at the memory. Chris shook his head and then froze as someone emerged from the shadows, coming from the direction of the town. Chris stiffened and Rudy casually took a stance that would allow the woman to do many things at once. Good evening, or is it night? Is it dark? Ah, the intricacies of light and the sun. The man called his long, dark hair tied neatly back in a ponytail, his face cheerful. His clothes were tasteful and scholarly, crisp black trousers and a shirt that would not allow wrinkles. The hands hidden by white gloves made a complete image. Chris took a few seconds forward as the man seemed utterly entranced by the night as it was some new concept. Mr. Japes, may I ask why you are here? Chris smiled as if a ghost were stretching his lips against his will. The man blinked and then smiled at Chris. My... Peace creeper, Quiss, fire smasher, are you also here for the temptations of the night? He asked with a soft tone and really saddled up next to Quiss in support. What can we do for you, Pothead? She grinned and Quiss closed his eyes as an intense pain blossomed in his head. Rudy induced migraines were the worst. Japes tilted his head. Why, I am here to go inside the dungeon, he said, puzzled by the question. Quiss shook his head. No one is to go in. The elders all agree. He was cut off as Japes took out a small jar. Fire was in Chris's hand before he could think about it, and Rudy had a dark knife in her hand, ready to throw it. Japes ignored them both and brought the pot to his ear and opened the lid slightly, listening. Hmm, yes, I do believe so. No, no need for the such things. Shh, no more talk. Japes acknowledged the jar and put it back in his pocket. Chris's hands felt cold. It was odd. He was holding a primal fire, and yet the man made Chris sweat uncontrollably. The tiny noise of Rudy grinding her teeth made Chris know that he wasn't the only one who was nervous. Japes tilted his head back and peered at both of them. The distance, the moonlight, the shadows. It made Japes look like a scholar and more like a curious surgeon who had just spotted something odd in his usual operation. Fire smasher. Darkness, Bane, I don't have any special jar for you. Would you like one? I would make it perfect, just for you. He offered in his polite and cheerful voice. Quis ignored how the fire grew dark. Control. I must decline. You aren't here to break the laws, are you? He called and Javes looked upset at the words. His pleasant smile fell into a sad expression. I would never... Rules are important. They can contain society. They contain society. And I can never bring myself to shatter such a... Uh, Raja things. He said if Quiss were to accuse him of doing such a thing, it would not be a good thing. Japes, the rule is that no one is to go inside. So end of discussion, Rudy snapped. The wildest man looked up and smiled. Of course, I live to help the law, like removing pests. He found this amusing and had to cover his monstrous grin that stretched inhumanly across his face. It took a moment that James' face returned back to normal. Quiss had the next 31 spells ready in his head to chant, but the words squirmed inside like invasive worms. Pests, echoed Quiss, and James pulled out another jar. This one looked odd, like it was made more from an animal hide than a mud or ceramic. James put the jar to his air. Hmm... Hi, I see. Master Delta needs you. Shh. I am trying to take you home, but sadly, my little green friend, I am not allowed. I shall try again tomorrow. He promised as the monstrous grin. Chris's fire went out, and he pulled on a weapon that was far worse. His badge. Japes frowned at it, and his playful look melting away as liquid clay. Release the goblins, or I will arrest you. He warned, and Japes raised an eyebrow in curiosity. On what charge? He smiled and Quiss smiled back. Destruction of the dungeon, he stated, and Rudy shot away from Quiss as if he just slapped her. Japes lost all facial expression, and the blank canvas of his eyes and flat mouth were the scariest things yet. Quiss forced his voice not to tremble as he carried on. By taking those contracted monsters, you are halting the progression of this dungeon here. 
under my reasoning and the fact that you are trying to gain access after weakening the dungeon leads me to think that you are trying to shatter Dalta. He called, presenting a little piece of metal that had been golden crown with a sword through it. The crown rested on the hilt of a sword and the word Peacekeeper was stamped at the bottom. It glowed with an eerie light as Quiz spoke. The badge of a Peacekeeper. It was a seal to act as the king's place, no matter where or with whom. It allowed Quiz to do three things. One, to let him sit in the pub all day and drink. Two, it occasionally let him get free pint at the pub. And three, it allowed Quiz to summon a member of the royal guard with one-time use of teleportation rune that would most likely take Quiz's hand off as a cost. A royal guard was not a toy soldier to annoy or for favor. To have one on beck and call was a responsibility, and the fact that the badge would kill anyone who tried to use it without the proper authority was another little uh, fun thing to about it. Japes, without a word, smashed the jaw and two cursing goblins fell out and rapidly vanished spaces. Japes bowed stiffly and turned without a word, his back bulging slightly and his body twitched. The goblins fled into the dungeon to home. Rudy sighed, dropping back to the grass, finally breathing. Fricking demon spit, what the frick? She demanded, and the badge glowed with some warning. Squiz snorted and pocketed it. Calm down, I wasn't actually going to use it. A royal guard is summoned, but I don't get to choose which one. Trust me, we don't want to be bringing Zale here. It'd be better just to cut off our own heads to save us the trouble. He grumbled, japes the potter. What had the man wanted? He sat down, all thoughts of the pub gone. Here, Rudy offered her flask, and Quiz took a swig without asking what it was. It burned and then froze in his throat. Does your mother know that you stole her debitory wine? He asked casually, and Rudy smirked with an answer as all that he needed. Colin Javin Japes inhaled and tidied himself up. He twitched again at the wrongness increase. He put his hand on the wall at the nearest building to ride out the agitation. It itched at him. Curve up, smooth down. He repeated and walked ahead as the manor made his unique sense go haywire. It had never acted up before in this town. A blessing. But now it itched. Itched, itched, itched. He took another deep breath and trubbed his face. Annoyed at the lack of control, the goblins had simply startled him, and he didn't know why he just didn't let them go. Old habits. Why let hostages go to waste? Oh, those were the days, but now he was just wanted to make simple pots, and someone was making him itch. Someone, somewhere, was making a mess of his art. Mr. Mushy hummed as he snapped two pots together and made a new handle on the new creation. It was a gentlemanly pot, an extra handle to be helpful for those to carry it. Mr. Mushy was pleased and Swan got better at fire, only slightly burning his new pots now. He couldn't wait to try making a pot with no bottom. It would be so glorious. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 32. Catch and Mist. Delta hum as she eyed the massive room. It was a blank slate, the roots covering the floor, breaking into parts of the smooth dirt floor. Crawled up the walls and stopped just before the ceiling. To Delta, this room was bright as day, and she knew that it was in total darkness. Delta pretended to adjust goggles. Amazing, this tech is so advanced that I can barely tell that we're wearing any. Can this surpass the wooden cog? She mocked in a deep voice and shook from several stealth games that she had played. Stretching, she walked forward, and her current pace she would hit the end of the room for some time. She was used to the tight halls or the grove, or even the bottom of the pond. The space was so much more that Dalta actually felt a little like a mouse that had left the safety of her cartoon mouse door. Ho and Gob came back a short while ago, and they seemed pretty angry, but they didn't want to say what was wrong. Hob looked like he was about to punch something, and Gob was just bowing his head and dropped what little offerings they had. Dalton could have pushed, but the goblins immediately left, almost with a yell. And did another spider attack them? If everything Dalton had learned about goblins was true, then they didn't like being losing. Dalton frowned and turned to the back stair room where her core sat. 
They'll be fine. They are, in some limited way, immortal. New, never practical box reminded her and darted across her arms and sighed. So, dying is not going to help anyone if they might come back changed or they might get cocky because of it. I have to pay for them, which isn't cheap, and whatever killed them might come looking for more sources of where they keep coming from. Delta said aloud a new ding in surprise. That is, yes, that is all very correct. I'm impressed by your reasoning. Delta gave the box a look. I'm not a total airhead. I don't want them to die because I don't want them in pain. If they told me they would be coming back to life was torture, I'm not sure that I would bring them back ever. Not if they suffered. And all that other stuff is just because, you know, I guess, that I just thought that I didn't need to remind you that, that I care about them every time. Delta pointed out and stopped his steps. New was silent for a moment. No, you need not, and I'm supposed to be good at learning and adapting. Shall we get on with business? The goblins will tell us when they are ready. Not a concept that I'm used to, but it shall be educational. Delta smiled as New began to ponder to himself. Little boxes appearing around the main box to contain side thoughts and random numbers, all symbols. New was what would be for some while upset at his evolving nature. Delta didn't know what it would be like to gain awareness. She had always had it to her knowledge. Distracting him, even for a while, with tiny things like the nature of goblins and building a jungle in your second floor basement was something that Delta really didn't mind doing. She opened the list and looked at the jungle room options. Jungle room allow you to regulate the temperature to a range of mild, warm, humid and hot, 15 dp, and allow you to change the seeding into an image of the sky, 13 dp, and allow all tree saplings to grow at much faster rates, 25 dp, and allow the river to be formed to the middle of the jungle, 30 dp, construct more objects or create to unlock more options. Delta saw that it wasn't too bad of a list, and to begin with, with 69 mana out of the 70 now with a new room and 32 dp. Delta had some options, and Delta liked having options. She turned slowly and tried to imagine what she wanted from this room. What function should it serve her? And challenging the adventures, slowing them down as much as possible, full to the room with entertainment or mini games. Should it be anything dangerous about it? It was a blank canvas, and Delta felt like she was a painting with her fingers and eating the Play-Doh. She could mess this up, and the first floor only sort of worked out due to the lucky circumstances. What if she made some death trap? Delta lowered her fingers from the menu and hesitated for a moment. One step at a time. Is that not what you tell all of your dysfunctional monsters? To me, stop planning and just do. I feel ill at the idea, but it is very much better than just standing there looking sad. News barks jingled and she vanished before Delta could snap her head around at him. She opened her mouth and then closed it. She inhaled it and smoothed down her skirt. Delta paused and then looked down and saw something. She hesitated and moved her hand back down. Her invisible hands brushed invisible fabric. The flowy skirt brushed against her shins and Delta tried not to freak out. New, no, new. No. I have clothes, she called and New appeared, slowly, as if not sure that he wanted to be here. Well, yes, you've always had those. Delta's fingers shook slightly, and her voice came out small. New, can you see me? She asked, breath struggling to leave her throat. New's box moved up and down as if looking closely. Yes, you're a girl, you have hair, you have a skirt. Is this important? Delta grabbed the box. The fine edges digging into her hands, New dinged in alarm, but Delta shook slightly. I can't see myself, and I didn't even know that I had a body. She accused and New blinked out in her hands and the air above her. D don't, just don't grab me. New was outraged, but Delta just sat down hard, feeling the skirt over and over. She tried other places, but she felt nothing. New floated down and almost as if unsure, he spoke. You have hair. It is to your neck. You are all orange, I cannot tell your colors. You have a skirt, and you have odd shoes, flat and with straps across them. You have a shirt of a gentleman on the necktie. I cannot see anything else about you. You must, you must be feeling or regarding feelings because of the second floor. 
the more flaws you acquire, the more aware and omnipotent you become in your own space. You will only need a few more to gain an avatar. This is just a natural progression. Dalton nodded slowly. He was right. He had mentioned gaining an avatar when she gained more flaws. Dalton kind of thought that it would be all at once and not a piece by piece. She stood, and with a breathless chuckle, she spun, her skirt dancing out as she did so. It landed back down, and Dalta was glad to be a decent size. Dalta sat down way too often to feel happy otherwise. Dalta had a skirt. Dalta had clothes. It made her feel human in some way that she hadn't seen before. She turned to New and gave him a pat. His box turned pink, and he vanished with an annoying ding. One step at a time. No, you're a genius. She complimented, and in the distance, a ding vibrated through the floor in agreement. She flexed her fingers and began to swish her skirt as she moved forward. What did the jungle need besides everything dangerous in the world? It needed trees. It needed dozens of vines and the weirdest flowers people had ever seen. Excitement flooded her veins, and Delta gave another twirl, laughing as she spun. Screw what she wanted the floor to be. It would just become whatever Delta turned it into. She picked a spot and opened up a menu, and she began to list the things that she could use. Apples, three mana. Crunchy mushrooms, three mana. A slightly odd mushroom that, while not all that good, can provide some nutrition, leaves an aftertaste that lingers. Small wine sapling, twelve mana. Spotted cap, five mana. Medial fern, eight mana. Minor silver leaf, fifteen mana. Woodnull grass, 5 mana. Delta remembered she had a wine plant upstairs that didn't seem to be doing anything. She flicked the menu. She had it moved down to the jungle room floor with a cost of almost 3 mana. It would take some time for it to move, so Delta spent some mana to get the woodnull grass. It appeared in a single flash, greenish greyish grass, that came up to her knees roughly, and when she did so, the box opened. Jungle Room feature found a living ecosystem. Plants and some animals will spread on their own without any mana cost. In return, they will also fade or die to feed another section of the ecosystem, or the next generation of life. Exceptions to this are uniques, rares, and contracts. Monsters will not spread, magic plants will not spread at a much slower rate. As she finished reading, the grass had a little tiny stalk growing in every direction. Delta bent down and watched in awe as the grass grew at an accelerated speed. She held her finger to the grass. Wooden all grass, a common grass that thrives in dangerous forests and mana-rich areas. It's mostly a weed, but some clever people can do things with it. Grass to hide her evil critters. Delta needed snakes, the beautiful kind with the round faces and sleepy natures. Maybe she could get one that would speak in a hissing accent to the new wizards or mages that came in. Delta giggled at the thought before she moved on to the next item, the medial fern. She held her finger to it and then hummed as she read it. Medial fern, a fern that has leaves that curl up when people approach. It has a few interesting uses in various crafts. Delta purchased it and placed it in a fair distance away from her grass. It blossomed up and from the ground and looked like some elegant performance. The leaves separated on top of the growth and the plant spread out across the ground. The single round core in the middle, it wriggled once or twice and then the pod in the middle exploded into the air and arched away from the foam. A few moments later, the pod landed and rolled for a moment before it wiggled and the roots pulled it underground. Delta walked over and peered into the hole with wide eyes. Then another fern began to grow. The pod of the new fern was smaller and it wouldn't be ready for a little while. Delta's jungle was kick-ass and Delta moved to the next spot, already readying the next one. She stumbled as something rumbled. She spun and she saw that the wine sapling had finally planted itself from the previous floor. Except it was now exploding upwards into the ceiling its soft green skin turning into a wooden bark, the large lush branches spreading out, and the shaking subsided as it dropped slightly over the entrance of the door, as if shielding those who wandered in from the sky. Delta stood there, stunned, as the tree rustled and the soft green powder fell from the branches onto the ground. Delta hastily put her finger onto the trees. Please don't poison people. 
she repeated and the box opened with a sarcastic ring. Why am tree, a rare tree that makes many odd conditions to grow right. Due to being in a dungeon, you skipped many. The tree can grow in many directions and sizes. Its wood is rather hard. The green spores sporting from its branches act as a natural health booster. It provides small bursts of green mana and enhances the body healing speed. I don't need to tell you that the tree has many uses. It does seem to be somewhat needy, and the ground has deep roots. The max that you may have is four in this big jungle room, and one per normal room. There were many questions, and Delta just blurted one out. Mana has colors, not just blue? She asked, not sure how she felt about her sacred mana bar being tainted by other colors. Red for rage and yellow for dexterity are uh, acceptable, she guessed. Mana is many colors. Your mana is orange, obnoxious to a cherry for such an odd color. It suits you. Delta pinched the box with two fingers and knew let out a shrill bell noise as he blinked away. Delta smiled and looked up and she held eyes and odd powder fell down occasionally. New was right. Some of it was orange and it looked so at odds with the rest of the tree that Delta could relate. As something didn't belong or act right but tried its best. Delta turned and saw the woodnall grass was slowly spreading over the area and another medial firm exploded somewhere. It was good, but she still needed proper trees. The YM tree needed space, and Dalton needed the trees that would hug the crap out of each other. With a shrug, she closed her eyes and thought of her favorite and iconic forests in her youth. All video games. Delta was sure that she didn't do for real forests, except now that she was building a jungle. What features made them memorable? Mazes, horrible fetch quests, poison ninjas, tigers, dinosaurs, growling noises. Delta grimaces and try it again. What made them memorable in a good way? Something struck her and Delta blinked. It sort of went with a maze idea, but they weren't tied together. She opened up a menu and began to mess with options. I see. Hmm. It is possible, but since it's a moving system of dungeon life, it has to be able to sustain itself. We would need some upgrades. Delta hummed and she opened the jungle room. Jungle room. Allow to regulate the temperature range between mild, warm, humid, and hot, 15 dp. Allow you to change the seeding into an image of the sky, 13 dp. Allow all the tree saplings to grow at a much faster rate, 25 dp. Allow a river to be formed through the middle of the jungle, 30 dp. Allow plants to crossbreed in their own, if able, 30 dp. Give the ability for plants to mutate if they become blood-soaked. Must be fresh and from non-human dungeon life. 40 dp. Allow you to create areas where plants do not overgrow. 20 dp. She had the beginning of a plan. Delta thought about it and then checked compared to her options. The river cost 30 dp. Carving it out and filling it with her own water would cost her far more into the hundreds for some task. That one was no brainer. If Delta wanted to abuse her endless source of water and lack of airflow to any outside world, she needed to also gain the ability to manipulate the heat. When the heat and water came together, she had her first obstacle that would make her homage to one of her most played games. If nothing else, it would allow her to level to have an advantage over any monster that it made in past ran. Unless it was a mist monster, then she was just screwing herself over. Delta purchased the river and watched as the ground from one corner of the room began to hollow out towards the far corner. Like some invisible monster devouring the soil, it carved a clean basin. It avoided her plants and the grass as best it could, and when it was done, the small holes that appeared in one corner gushed clear with water and began to pull then surge forward towards the far corner. This corner only had one hole and the water drained slowly. Delta could only watch in awe as nature bent to her desires. A marvel that would take hundreds of years to form in ten minutes. The water reached the rough top of the banks and stopped rising. The river would take Delta, taking three full jumps to cross it if she could get a running start. It wasn't too deep, but if someone couldn't swim, then it might be dangerous. She would have to work around that somehow. The river had some pool to it, and draining hole allowing the water to move in some mimicry of real water. Delta was about to cheer when a box appeared. River has been purchased. All plant-based items cost one less mana in the jungle room. 
This cannot go beyond the total of one mana. Water options are unlocked. The river has its options unlocked. And I shall just remove the boiling water feature. I feel already that you will reject it idea. It can't be lowered beyond skin blistering. Delta blinked and then looked horrified at the idea. My river is cool one. It doesn't boil people. New, tell me when I can make the water sparkle or something neat. Delta order and New paused for a moment. We... Well, I guess we can do more fishing? Not much other options unless we begin to get creative. Delta thought about it and then looked above, imagining her first floor. Her mushrooms had a good idea, but it was so lazy to reuse platforms so quickly. Delta thought about it and then paused. Rivers. Platforms. Her mind was set by images of spinning fruits, magic wooden masks, and spinning marsupials. New tell me how much would it take to get platforms that move up and down the river and sink after you stay on them after a moment. She asked aloud and New took a moment to think about it. The costly thing would be to make the platforms be endless. I suspect that we need some form of enchantment or room rule. Would you like to see the rules? Delta eyed the box with suspicion. Well, it break the bank. She asked slowly and New only glowed once. Delta sighed and then nodded. Enchantment or rulemaking. A dungeon core may apply special rules or effects to a room for a cost of mana and DP. An example is that a door may only be opened with a specific key. This will prevent lockpicking. However, someone may simply blow the door off its hinges. The magic only works in so many ways. Layering enchantments on the same object make the cost of enchantments rise beyond reasonable cost. It is best to create your idea with less amount of enhancements as possible, and except nothing will be foolproof. For example, if you wish to make three platforms floating down the river reappear at the start once they reach the end, it'll cost 50 mana per platform, or 25 DP. Keep in mind, if you were to enchant the river itself to make any object reappear from the end to start at the beginning, it takes around 600 mana, or 300 DP. This is for a very simple move or teleport enchant. It is not something that the river may naturally do with items that you have available. Delta winced and pondered it. I can't afford that, but people need a ways to cross, don't they? She said weakly and nude only dinged. Says who? The only rule is that your core is not blocked off from the things that are humanly possible, be it of mind or brawn. If one cannot swim, then what is their weakness? not yours. If one cannot sing, then that is their own fault, not yours. And if one cannot knit, then it is their own weakness, not yours. Delta paused. That feels mean, she admitted, and New seemed to chuckle. It feels fair. If you are defenseless when all else fails, and there you are open to trial and error. Normally, it is just error and you have to nice dungeon thing. Let them struggle. It builds character and it makes them stronger and, uh, they will learn to swim? Delta flat stared seemed to make New shrink a little. I just want them to fall in the river. Delta sighed and patted New, her objective. You're a cat. A game system turned away and turned sarcastic. What if someone drowns? She asked, voice pointed. I shall put a sign that says, Caution, deep water, before the river. If that fails, I shall put another sign a bit further away that says, Caution, words ahead, read them. If that fails, I shall put a sign across the river that says, Caution, if you are wet, you were warned. I like to cover all of my potential areas. Delta threw her hands up in the air, growling at him. You just can't throw signs at everything and expect it to be covered. She argued, and Delta felt a fizzle in her manner. A sign appeared before the river, and it read as followed. Caution! Splinters on the sign! Please help yourself! New. Delta inhaled and exhaled. It was stuck with a passive-aggressive menu system that was having an existential crisis. Delta prayed for strength that she just made a rough fallen log out of her manor, and then landed clumsily and rolled a few times as it seemed to find a good hold and land and became still. It was a bit of a thin and wouldn't take that much to break if someone tried. Oh yes, I would very much like to see people fall off the log first and then into the river. Delta grabbed New and threw his box into the river. He simply floated out, untouched. Delta would need to break into his system and tickle him or annoy him or... or have someone do it for her. 
She knew exactly who would be perfect for the job. Oh, Mr. Mushy, she called, knowing her monster could hear her. New vanished instantly. Delta smirked as a cute mushroom made new run. The endless questions, the endless curiosity, just drove New mad. With some peace, she had only two tasks to do before she returned to the first roar. She took her time to fill up the river with her four types of fishes and her tangleweed, the crayfish, the yellow belly cod, the white tail fish, and the little finned guppy. If the room's nature was true, then they spread on their own. She put her head into the water and watched as their tiny guppy, swung as fast as it could, glowed once, and then some scaly cell split in two. Delta was reminded of a movie. No time for sex. If she ever made a humanoid that could reproduce like this, would they come out each of the ribs? Delta made a sour face and wondered if God had been like this, trying not to look too closely as things happened, just placing an apple tree and telling Satan to stop being a snake. Was new her Satan? This raised way too many questions, so Delta quickly moved on to her next task. She opened her menu and pushed the newest monster option. The space before her rippled as the flesh came into view. It was slightly hunched over, but its height was that of a small man or a tall teen, yellowish skin that was ringed by a black markings. Its chest was humanoid and rather muscular, and the legs became thin and looked odd until the monster crouched and the powerful muscles made for jumping branched up. The clothes were more basically the jungle itself, hide like pens and leaves to provide camouflage a necklace of stones and odd markings that looked painted on. It opened its eyes and sideways pupils blinked once or twice. It inhaled and Delta saw how big its mouth was. A human head could fit in there and flexing jaw muscles made it damn clear that it could do some damage. The one hand, it was a wooden spear. The stone spear tip surrounded by feathers have some bird and the shaft had an intricate designs carved into them. The frogman spun with ease and held it out to Delta with both hands. Palms up. The frogman had a very human-like fingers. My queen of my home, I am yours to command. I will die for you. He said, and his voice was deep. Like the well, the frog got stuck in and thought there was the whole world. Delta felt slightly sure no well was going to contain this frog by any means. Oh, hello, nice to meet you, Delta said nervously, and the frog didn't move still holding the spear to Delta's general direction, using her voice to know where she was standing. He didn't say anything. So, you can stand up. It's fine, my name is Delta. She tried again and the frog stood up slowly and looked around. Where shall I guard? I shall deliver your foe's hearts to you, my goddess. He vowed and Delta waved her hands. No, 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 no heart taking or killing. She said quickly, and for the first time the frogman looked perplexed. His large cheeks moved down as his tongue rolled out. I, yes, I will not taint your realm with unworthy blood. He promised and bowed again. There was a moment where nothing happened, and the frogman looked up unsure. I am ready to be punished for assuming your wishes. He said slowly, and Delta felt a headache fast approaching. There was a movement at the corner of her eyes, and Mr. Mucci approached. He looked, winded, as if the air around him was too thin. He waved and Delta thought that she heard a noise. The frogman tilted his head. Bow to the goddess, she has been that demands respect. What are you doing here? The frog questioned and his tone became hard as if Mr. Mushy was breaking some law. I called him here, she said and he froze. Mr. Mushy handed the frogman a misshapen pot. Delta beamed and Mr. Mushy nodded with friendliness. See, he brought you a welcome to the dungeon gift. Listen, some ground rules, uh, you need a name. Delta trailed off, and the frogman looked between the pot, Mr. Mushy, and her. He looked rather confused and looked back down at the pot. I am a simple monster, the shadow of the jungle, a member of the tribe. I am, I do not deserve a name. He tried to take back away, but Delta just followed him. You don't look like a hopper, which I guess is racist now. Hmm... Jungle names aren't my forte, but you're hardly a Jack or a Joe, Dalton muttered. The frogman reached the edge of the river and looked like one would rather jump in to accept a name. Dalton stopped and eyed him. What's wrong? she asked, and he put the pot down gently. I am not sure why I am here. I am your tool to kill, and yet I am not allowed to kill. I possess no magic to turn 
or to put foes to sleep. My goddess, why did you make me? He asked bluntly, and Dalta blinked. Because I wanted to meet you. I was excited to have another monster around. I want to see what you do, or see how you enjoy being around. I'm going to build you a nice jungle, so don't worry. Dalta assured him. Something popped into her head. Your name is Rail. It's simple and relevant, Dalta beamed, and Rail seemed to shiver before he bowed. I am truly not worthy. I must go. He said quickly and jumped into the river in a single bound. Dalta's mouth fell open, and Rail moved into the quickly spreading grass. Dalta felt like she had failed utterly at this. Rail didn't seem to enjoy or accept that her goblins had. Dalta wanted to follow, but decided to give the frog some time. If she could understand Rail, then she could understand how the frog tribesmen worked as a whole before summoning more. Mr. Mushy eyed the river and picked up his pot and scooped up some water. The water began to leak out of the four holes, but Mr. Mushy seemed pleased. He held it up for Delta to see, getting hit in the face with the water as he did so. Delta smiled softly and decided just to wait. She was good at that. Rail, rail, rail. A glorious name, wasted on pond scum. What had he done? What had he accomplished? What had he managed to do to deserve such a boon? Nothing, and the shame burned in his chest. He had just run from his goddess. He was too ashamed to face her. A box appeared and Rail froze. Enough. This was the voice of power, not the goddess but her shadow. Master, I cannot accept enough. You have been given a gift and you throw it in her face. Delta, your goddess is a light and there is no purpose for your existence and it scares you. There is no reason and it binds you and there is no destiny and that weakens you. I am not the goddess. She will wait until you are done being petty. I have no patience. You are a proud warrior of Delta. You will repel but not go for the kill. You will guard her heart but not hurt it. You will listen to me when I say that you are unique. Not the boon but an actual word. Delta wants you to grow into your own power. She believes in you and wants you to try. Running away from her does not change anything. I had my doubts but she has unlocked created so many paths already. She is power, and she is corruption. Rail watched as the box went blank for a moment. Delta makes you want to be better, and we are not designed for it. We will try anyway, because it hurts her if we don't. Be the warrior you are meant to be. But don't rely on Delta to force it. Now stand, Rail. He stood, how could he not? We are wrong. We are not logical. We are dungeon, and yet we are free. We are Delta. We are Delta, he repeated, and a sense of peace fell over him. It was okay. He didn't have to understand. Rayo blinked as he felt Delta's warmth inside of him. It was okay to be a little wrong. That was the warmth told Rayo at the moment. He struggled to fit the purpose into acceptance, but he stood regardless. Now go away. I have signs to put up. He bowed and walked slowly back to where Dalta was still. He could hear the gentle voice talking to the walking fungus. Yes, the mushroom was right. Not just a goddess, a mother. But he was just not a child, but soon he would grow into a worthy warrior for her. He, Rail, first of his kind, bowed it. This time the words really felt more powerful in his heart, which began to beat louder. End of chapter there is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 33, The Curious Container Vass watched as Master Japes' newest creation formed with a particular agitated feeling. Vass didn't know what was causing the master to feel the way he did. In Vass's time, they had never known Master Japes to be anything other than slow and methodical, sometimes a bit happy as his old stories of his old days. The master had his odd smile when he spoke of those days. Vass saw the master turn the pot over and sigh, letting the new pot fall from his hands and onto the floor. The smashing sound sent a jolt up Vass's spine. That way it shattered into countless pieces, sending the once interesting features to the four corners of the room and a clattering of broken pieces. Vass was still as the noise faded from his ears. Clean that up. Hi, I'm tired. My head is... 
Master Chapes seemed to struggle with his own irritation. He strained up and then smiled his best with a slow nod. Leave it. I know how it upsets you to clean up such messes. I'll do it tomorrow. You are free for tonight. Remember the rules. Master Japes said, and the words were like a breeze. Gentle, but Vass could feel the potential storm that could brew in, in an instant. Yes, I will not leave the village. I will not break the laws of this town. I will not try to become a tree. I will not set fire to the black alley of bards if they refuse to stop singing. I will never, ever reveal your secrets. Vass repeated confidently, and Master Japes sighed. How does one child get into so much trouble? He asked himself and smiled at the thoughts that followed. Vass didn't even blink. They looked like their person of twenty. No more, no less. Perhaps it was the way that Vass's sleeves were a tiny bit too big for their arms, or the way that their bed hair was eternal and made Vass look like. As Master Japes often joke, Vass had been dragged through the bush backwards, and the bush turned into a druid, who threw some good storm magic at Vass for good measure. Master Japes bent down slightly and cupped one of Vass's cheeks. I'm a harsh, but you are a good child. Go, enjoy the night and I'll see you soon. He ushered and with a wave with one hand, Vass didn't really need much prompting. Vass enjoyed being helping Master Japes. The work was soothing and Master Japes made very beautiful work. Vass made pitiful attempts, none that quite met the standards of Master Jape, but the man encouraged Vass was keep working at it. Vass liked pottery. Vass liked walking in the night just a bit more. The dark town was never truly quiet. Too many interesting people lived here to keep a strict day and night schedule. The star seers set up shop and argue over the two-headed horse sign. Was it fading or rearing? Vass watched as the shapely dressed man ducked out of the marble building. The glint of a fang made Vass tilt their head. Von the banker, a dangerous man. Master Japes had said so, but told Vass that he had nothing to fear if he remembered to be respectful. Out of your nightly stroll are we, apprentice Vass? The banker asked as Vass took in the moment to appreciate how similar the names were, like two pieces of a pottery that had been inspired by one another. Von wasn't the man's real name, middle, fake, or even the accurate name. Vass knew to call him Mr. Von because everyone did. And Vass had asked why he was called that once, and Master Japes just pursed his lips and said not to ask, or Vass would be cleaning clay dust off the walls for the next three nights. Vass never asked again. Yes, Mr. Von, I hope you have a good night. Vass said, bowing the head, and the man chuckled as he moved away. He seemed to aim directly for a small bar near the end of the street. I always do, young thing, he promised with a rather spectacular turn of his large coat vanished into the building. Vass read the sign, The Milk Glass. Vass nodded once. Having read it every night, it seemed like a nice enough place, but Vass had no such desire to drink milk like Mr. Von. Instead, Vass continued down the road, stopping to pick up a few things from the people had dropped. A knobby potato, some used matches, a broken wheel for some cart. Vass picked them up and put them into a small bowl on this side. Vass plucked a dangling apple from Mrs. Dabagoth's garden. The tree hissed, but didn't really do anything. Vass sighed and longed to be a tree. They seemed to have such interesting lives. Using one hand, Vass swirled the knickknacks together, and a bowl was not theirs, but Master Japes. It was a special bowl, if Master was to be correct, which he usually was. The wheel, the potato, the apple, the matches began to blur together, and the bowl glowed slightly. The magic began to change and the object into a singular object. It was some rubbish vegetable on a wooden stick. Vass used one finger to move it and the odd thing spun with a sticky like wheel or a windmill. Their bowl let out a sigh as the magic faded for the night. Vass liked making things. Even the mixing bowl let Vass create things. Vass began to slow down as the house appeared. Vass clutched the ball and the most likely flammable vegetable in both his hands, and there was no lights or any sign of life. Vass felt an emotion stirring, and they quickly rushed over and placed the vegetable near the door. The clean place was on the little mailbox, so Vass put it in there. They turned and ran, ducking into the usual hiding spot. Feeling dizzy, Vass could only watch the night went on. Then Quiss appeared. Vass felt their tongue go numb as Quiz picked up the odd vegetable. 
Quiz muttered something and peered around. Vass's chest hammered, and, in panic, they became unliving. Vass ceased to th. Vass blinked and saw Quiz had gone inside, sighing with relief. They moved away before Quiz reappeared. Twice in one night would be too much. Master Japes had not, he hadn't, warned Vass of how their chest would hurt or how their head would go odd around the peacekeeper. Maybe it wasn't supposed to happen. Vass thought about that and then shrugged. Supposed to or not, it happened, and Vash relished the feeling. If they could be a tree, they could watch Quiss all day. Trees had that sort of free time. Vass needed to move around the puddle in the road. Old habits die hard. Hey, you! A voice called, and it came from the direction of the house. Quiss's house. Vass turned and saw a woman coming towards him. Ruli, a friend of Quiss. Quiss, as she knew, was Quiss, and she would tell Quiss that Vass had been near their house. Vass panicked and ceased to see. They blinked once, and Vass saw that they were no longer in the middle of the road, but instead inside of a pub, Ruli draining her jug of drink and burped. Vass shrunk in on itself, and Ruli eyed them and smiled. Oh, you're alive. Was thinking I scared you to death she said by way of a greeting. Vass looked around and saw other people were drinking, but no one paid them any attention. Perhaps it was the man who was stacking glasses on top of the ominous cursed-looking statue. Maybe it was the barmaid who split herself into three for a moment to serve drinks before becoming one again. Whatever it was, Vass was not exactly eye-catching in the spa. Sorry, just didn't want to leave you in the middle of the road. You're Japes' pet, right? Rooney asked with a little tack. Vess nodded and made sure that to hold the bowl tightly with both hands. The master would be angry if Vass lost it. So, what's the deal? Why is Japes being such an ass? Rooney asked loudly and Vass had a flash of the rules in his head. I cannot say. Vass tried and Rooney popped some peanuts into her mouth. Right. Serve until you die. Kinda your golem shtick, right? I'm not asking for his wares, his dongs, or his bottle speedos. I just need to know why he was so trying to get into the dungeon. Rudy said, voice going a little soft. Vass blinked and shook their head. I cannot say, Vass replied confidently, and Rudy rolled her tongue around as intrigued by Vass's words. She nodded as if giving in, and took another deep drink of her mug. I mean, I can ask Quist to come down. I'm sure you'd love to talk to him. Ruli said, smiling cheerfully, and made a motion to stand. Vass's body jerked, and they knew Ruli could see the panicked look on Vass's face. Dab, calm down, you don't dare to be comatose on me again. She warned and Vass tried to sink down into the chair. Music played through the series of fairies. Each one looked like they were about fifty, smoked once a minute, and got drunk every night. N -n not quiss, Vass stammered, and Ruli raised one brow. Usually, when people say that, I get where they're coming from. You. I don't think you're afraid of him, considering the tracks around his house and the smell of that weird thing that you left lingering in your hand. Or oh, sweet on that old jerk. Ruli accused as if Vass was being caught doing something unnatural. Maybe Vass had been. Did empty containers for their master's power develop feelings? What about ones that were filled to the brim of contained magic? Vass didn't know. Vass wondered what it would be like if Quiz asked them to saw some of Quiz's magic. The table thumped as Vass's knee jerked in that reaction of thought. Vass put the mixing bowl over their head and tried to block out Rudy's existence. Breathe. Vass needed to breathe. Vass didn't actually need to breathe, but it felt appropriate for the moment. Rudy shook her head. Listen, just a simple yes or no, yeah? Just give me the general vibe and I don't know. Get you a pair of this dirty socks. Steal his hair for you. Whatever mushy crap that you want. Rudy tempted, happily selling Quiss for information. Vash tried to pull the mixing bowl harder over their head. This was bad, bad, bad. The rules, Quiss, the choice. Vash took the bowl off of the head and stood. I must leave. Neither my master nor I have any nefarious business with the dungeon. I am not privy to my master's secrets. Goodbye. Vash strode to the door, but then swung open, and Quiss walked in, looking grumpy, tired, annoyed. Wonderful. Really, where are you? Wiped my coins, you little bushrat, he called, and then he looked down at Vass. 
Evening, Apprentice Bass. Sorry, didn't mean to shout in your face, he said and began to peer about the room. Bass's existence became a series of tightly controlled thumps. Music, glass, clinking, voices faded to Bass's beating core. Quiss was saying something, but it didn't matter, because Quiss was a fire, and Vass wanted to be a tree that could catch his light. Vass ceased to think, and the thumping took over. Someone spoke. Vass blinked once and turned to face Master Japes, the early light shining on his smooth face. Vass moved forward and barely caught the mixing bowl that fell off their head. Master Japes was holding a note and was looking at Vass with a pointed look. Peacekeeper Quiz brought you home from the local pub. According to him, you froze and then occasionally swayed to an unseen breeze. Master Japes repeated the note's words. Bass couldn't meet his eyes. I warned you about being a tree. These words came quick, like a whip, as Vass nodded mutely. Japes sighed and then motioned to the door. Come, we need to get ready. I have an interview with the elders. You can come, as I don't trust you to not stand there all day swaying. Master Jabe smiled slightly as Vass blushed. They returned to the mixing bowl and locked the cabinet and helped the master gather his belongings. Why are you seeing the elders? Vass asked quietly, and Master Jabe put two fingers to his temple. To sort out a growing problem, it's either that or I shall unleash Gertie. He jested and Vass dropped the rather expensive pot in his words. He frowned at the mess and then rolled his eyes. I was just jesting. Gertie is a last resort and we both know that. He said over the shoulder as Vass began to lock up shop and then Vass swallowed the keys like they were a light snack. He sorted the keys into one of his compartments. The elders met together around the town on a Tuesday. One I could never really know where exactly that they would meet until someone spotted them. Master must have been prepared as he headed straight to the cafe. Cafe plus one was what Master James called a trendy place. Vass didn't know what that was, but he knew that it was insulting. The pretty waitress smiled and nervously as Master James asked to see the elders, his special smile appearing slightly to hurry the process along. Vass saw that the wall was covered in with some odd posters. Don't have death in motion, grab a health potion. Check twice or pay the price, missing a teleporter orb, not even once. Be nice to the healer, damage class bias is not cool. The tables where people sat and ate were a little close. The tables where people sat to eat, little choose your own adventure menus and forks that looked like odd tridents, while the knives looked something as the novice might think was good for rogues. The server behind the bar flicked something on his glasses, and then they switched from a clear glass to a vivid purple. He nailed some wooden pipe that was not respecting mage, would use and tried not to cough as Master Japes glared. The elders near the back nodded as Elder Pick rolled his edible dice. My elven protester uses Mass's animal outrage. The Dark Lord loses five stats across the board due to sponsors putting out of this campaign. He grunted and the elder Josie nodded and she rolled. Not bad. I guess I'll activate my shape-shifting rock passive. I'll become a tropical gnome minority with one arm missing, granting me a 30% increase to my next three actions. Oh, hello, Jolin, she called, and it took a moment for Vast to register the fact that she was talking to the master. My fair elders, I have to break up your weekly session, P D D L G B Q E D, but I must really talk about the access to the dungeon. Master James smiled charmingly, and Haldi mumbled something, and his giant troll wearing a princess tiara moved forward on the little payment. We heard, challenging Quiss, I didn't take you for a fool. Elder Josie said calmly, and Master James bowed his head in agreement. He put his hands behind his back, and Vass saw how tightly he was holding each hand. Messily and rude, I agree. It doesn't change the fact that I am being plagued from the manor. Dungeon manor is never easy to readjust to, he reminded and all the elders gave him flat looks. We're quite aware. Do you see Ash rushing in to cause trouble for the dungeon? Pick nearly ate his wall in his sleep. How he is? Well, he won't say, but he's going from this eccentric to plotting. And Elder Jose pointed out that she leaned forward, eyes deep yellow. The first few levels are the worst. They are meant to drive people into dungeons, blood-soaked ground. 
This was Basics 101, Japes. Level 3 will be less and level 4 will be hard. 5 to 7 will be a breeze and then 8 will end up with me throttling the next person who annoys me, she murmured. Vass was trying to be a pebble. If felt like she was stuck between clashing titans and Vass felt too scared to move. What if fair play comes? You think all those fools hyped up the dungeon manor are going to behave? The fair play will halt the dungeon and force it to grow levels. This will attract the juices that follows their muck like flies to dung. The juices will run out of their fix once the manor die does not come until the 10 levels. And then it'll turn bad. The calculators will come and this dungeon will be dissected and harvested like a fresh corpse. Your king will allow it and your queen will rebel and civil war will break out again. Master Japes' face distorted into a monstrous visage that Vass's master kept hidden mostly. All three elders just listened. So concerned, I'm sure your heart is bleeding for Delta. Elder Josie said with a blank smile. Vass saw her eyes were glowing slightly brighter now. I just want to solve my problem before it becomes an epidemic and I have to leave, Master Japes reasoned. They all looked at each other for a moment. I don't mind. Permission makes all the difference, no? But you fought with Quiss, so you're getting punished. Elder Pick grinned, which made Haldi snuffle with chuckles. You, Joel and Japes, are not to go near the dungeon. Elder Josie smiled the real one this time. Master Japes looked a little frustrated, but hid it quickly. Then how am I supposed to solve my problem? He asked almost sweetly. All three of their elders looked at Vass. Master Japes also began to look at Vass. The sudden weight of the looks made Vass panic. Vass wanted to be a tree very much at that moment. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link to below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.